Top Gear was a motoring show that was arguably the most popular British TV show during the early 2000s and 2010s, which dominated pop culture. It was a middle-aged man's leather jacket wet dream, spawning adaptations around the world and became a template for memes to flourish. So how did this powerhouse TV show abruptly end in a fiery ball of smoke? Now before I begin, I should mention that, yes, Top Gear is still on the air, but it's a shadow of what it once was. With the cast changing from a perfect chemistry of personalities to a corporate force friendship of cherry-picked Jack the Lad types from the British zeitgeist, which for some reason just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. The show went on for 22 seasons, so this isn't going to be a deep dive into the lore of Top Gear. I couldn't do it justice. However, in this video, I'm going to talk more about the trio that created the legacy of Top Gear and how it ultimately crashed into the side of a cliff. In order to understand the downfall of the show and how it ultimately ended up in flames, we need to go back. Each episode of Top Gear focused on a series of segments, switching between those filmed within the program's main studio before the studio audience and pre-recorded films conducted before the broadcast of an episode. Each of these films would be major segments of each episode, with the studio segments being used as links between them. Some of the most common segments include car reviews, the news, power laps, the cool wall, challenges and races. Although without a doubt the most popular thing to ever emerge out of Top Gear was the specials. The specials took the best part about Top Gear, which was the challenges, and amplified them by putting them in a foreign, often remote location with the task of reaching a destination. The specials really demonstrated the chemistry of the trio and why the show worked so well as a whole. Admittedly, I hold a lot of nostalgia to this show but taking off my rose-tinted goggles, I still believe there's been nothing like this show ever before. It stayed grounded amongst the supercars and explosions by the subtle nuances of the trio's authentic relationship. Their blend of personalities perfectly balances and complements one another, which allows for each presenter to get their flowers and time in the sun. As the series went by, Clarkson and co started receiving criticism about the predictability and scripting of the show. Andy Willman admitted that the three presenters were pretty much playing to their TV cartoon characters a bit too much, and the production team would be working towards keeping its dignity still intact, while experimenting with the new ideas for the program. The trio confronted this criticism head-on throughout the duration of the Grand Tour. Now, Top Gear wouldn't be Top Gear if it wasn't shrouded in controversy, which some could argue was because the show is broadcasting in every corner of the earth, so you're always going to have some critics. In fact, making fun of angrier people had written in to complain was a regular part of the news segment of the show. Throughout his time on the air, Top Gear and Jeremy had plenty of complaints and drama including, but not limited to, ridiculing environmental issues, Germans, Mexicans, and Poles, and alleged homophobia, and I'm pretty sure he said that all Spanish people chuck donkeys off of tower blocks. However, even though a lot of his comments caused international anger, it was never enough for the BBC to be too concerned with their cash cow. That was until 2014. Towards the end of 2014, the BBC allegedly became concerned with Clarkson's behaviour on the set and production of the show. This concern came after two incidents that year. The first involved an on-air take from the 19th season, in which Jeremy is attempting to choose between two cars using the traditional rhyme, eeny meeny, miny mo, but failing to censor the original version's use of the N-word. Now when I viewed this footage several weeks later, I I realized that in one of the mumbled versions, if you listen very carefully with the sound turned right up, it did appear that I'd actually used the word I was trying to obscure. I was mortified by this, horrified. It is a word I loathe. And I did everything in my power to make sure that that version did not appear in the program that was transmitted. In fact, I have here the note I sent at the time to the production office and it says, I didn't use the N-word here, but I've just listened through my headphones and it sounds like I did. Is there another take that we could use? Please be assured, I did everything in my power to not use that word. The second incident involved an investigation from Ofcom regarding the show's Burma special, which led to the program being found in breach of broadcasting rules. It saw Clarkson referring to an Asian man crossing the bridge that the presenters had just built as having a slope on it, which is a derogatory term used to refer to a person of East Asian origin. As a result of these events, the BBC issued Clarkson a final warning. At the time of the racist allegations, his co-presenter James May tweeted, Jeremy Clarkson is not a racist. 
He's a monumental bellend and many other things, but he's not a racist. I wouldn't work with one. On the 27th of December 2014, the Argentina special aired and documented an incident that reached national headlines before the episode was even shown. The controversy occurred due to one of the cars in the special having a number plate that read H982 FKL, which the Argentinians believed was a reference to the Falklands War, which we won of course. <laughs> The Argentinians were so furious with Top Gear that as soon as they caught wind that they were filming, they chased the entire production crew out of Argentina into Chile. This resulted in the trio ditching their cars in Tolhin, Argentina, where police found the abandoned vehicles. Inside they found two spare number plates, both reading B-E-I-I-E-N-D. The spare number plates made it even more obvious than it was before that this was most definitely done on purpose, despite the BBC saying otherwise. In March 2015, the 22nd series of the show was abruptly put into hiatus by the BBC. This allowed the broadcaster to investigate allegations of Clarkson verbally and physically abusing one of the show's producers, Oisin Timon. Right, I'm just going to admit it right here. If you subscribe to my channel right now, I will make sure to promise that I will give a valiant effort of saying everyone's name right in the future, but I cannot guarantee it. I'm just shit with names. This you're gonna have to put up with it. After a day of filming, Jeremy apparently fancied an eight ounce sirloin steak with fondant potatoes, pan fried wild mushrooms, grilled cherry tomatoes, and peppercorn sauce. However, Oisin told Jezza that he could only have a cold meat platter because the kitchen was closed. So naturally, he punched the producer. I mean, you can't blame him. After the allegations came out, Clarkson and James were interviewed about the predicament Jeremy found himself in. Jeremy, yes. I'm sorry. Are you worried about being arrested? Um, all I would like to say is I wish people I wish people would leave Osh alone because none of this is his fault. Are you ready? Hello. Well, do you support Jeremy? Uh, in many ways, no. I've said many times before the man is a knob, but I quite like him. It's all getting a bit ridiculous. W what do you understand about what actually happened? Not very much. I was blind drunk. Uh, no further comment. Sorry. On the 25th of March, Clarkson's contract with the BBC was terminated. The dust-up, as James describes it, cost Jeremy his job and £100,000 in an out-of-court settlement with Oisin Timmon. The Director General of the BBC, Tony Hall, stated, I've consistently said that I'll make a decision on the facts, and this morning, that's what I did. What we know is that the producer, Oshin Timmon, was indeed attacked by Jeremy Clarkson. Physical violence accompanied by prolonged verbal abuse has crossed the line. And that's why, with regret, I decided this morning that we will not be renew renewing Jeremy's contract. But I just want to end by saying a big thank you to Jeremy, who for nearly 25 years has produced extraordinary work on Top Gear. After Jeremy was fired, James was interviewed outside his house again, asking about his thoughts and his future with Top Gear. Well, apparently they shot him. Um, I've only found this out by prizing the information out of various BBC sources. Nobody's actually told me officially until a few moments ago when they emailed. Um, I don't really have anything to say about it. It's a tragedy. I'm sorry that what ought to have been a small incident sorted out easily turned into something big. I don't really want to say anything more than that at the moment. I've only known for the past few minutes. Uh, and if you'll excuse me, I very desperately have to write the eBay listing for my Ferrari. Can Top Gear continue? Uh, I'm sure Top Gear will continue in some way. It can, you know, it existed before us. It's been reformatted several times. Will you, but will exactly you stay? How. Will you stay at Top Gear? Um, well, I don't want to talk about that too much. But I think we're very much the three of us as a package. It works for very complicated reasons that a lot of people don't fully understand. So that will require a lot of careful thought. And what about a possible replacement for Jeremy? Who who would you be prepared to work with? Who would you like to work with? Um, much as I think he's a knob, I quite like working with Jeremy. After the sacking, Richard Hammond tweeted stating, Gutted at such a sad end to an era. We're all three of us idiots in our own different ways, but it's been an incredible ride together. On the 14th of November 2016, a year after the termination from the BBC, he made a public apology to Oisin and did an interview with the BBC, sharing his perspective on the whole situation. Um, the whole top it, was, it was tricky and there were tricky times. Why were they tricky? I was having a tricky year um, and it was quite stressy. And um, it, it, was, it was really hard. It was, it was just getting harder and harder to do that show because it was getting bigger and bigger all the time. 
the problems were getting bigger and bigger, the lack of support was appalling, home life was difficult. It was a very stressy time. You said you know, that there was a lack of support. Was that the BBC not giving the talent the show the support it needed? All I can say is, when you send Amazon a film, the television people in Los Angeles, they ring up and squeak with joy. What you never get at the BBC is that, ever. Because if somebody were to say, that was a great thing that you've just done, particularly if they wrote it in an email and then it turned out to be controversial and the Daily Mail went berserk, they'd be on record as having liked it. And then what would happen? After the trio became relieved from their positions on Top Gear, the BBC ushered in quite possibly the most random group of people and smashed them together and hoped it would become successful. Don't get me wrong, the show still does okay, but it reaches nowhere near the audience that it used to. Although Clarkson, May and Hammond may have lost their jobs, they didn't have to look far for new, more lucrative offers to take advantage of. With Amazon swooping in to sign the trio to a £160 million deal that would span across three seasons, making Jeremy £800,000 an episode, compared to his £1.5 million annual salary at the BBC. So in hindsight, they didn't really lose. In fact, it probably worked out better than they probably imagined. Top Gear was getting stale anyway, so to get paid way more and do something creatively fulfilling is a huge fucking dub. To be able to keep any show on the air for decades is an incredible achievement. So to win awards, maintain such a high standard of content while the stakes are constantly raising, and do it all with your best mates, is pretty astonishing. Looking back and taking off my rose-tinted glasses, it's difficult because they were dickheads. But when is it not funny to laugh at a dickhead? Thank you so much for watching this video. It genuinely, genuinely does mean the world to me. Make sure to follow me on Instagram at Fat Mima. Like, subscribe, and comment below what you want to see next.